Amen. If you're sitting on the outside, pass your cup to the center, please. Those in the center, if you'll pass your cups to the right, I'm sure these gentlemen will be happy to get those for you. <clears throat> I uh, get quite a few emails or people just ask me, say, hey, I'm moving to a certain area or I'm visiting from a certain area. Is there a church, believe it or not, like Fountain of Life? Makes me realize they need a lot of prayer. But, he would <laughs> but uh, just this past week, I had a lady, she said she visited here in uh, November from out in California. And uh, she lives in San Diego area. And she... Uh, had asked me in her email, uh, she's talking about how much the service meant to her, how she, uh, it stirred her to, to want to serve the Lord more, and uh, wanted to know if she could get a copy of the uh, service of that particular Sunday. And I said, well, on our website, flbconline.com, you can go to the archives, and hopefully uh, those sermons are, are there. Uh, they go back, I don't know how far they go back, but you can retrieve those sermons. She asked me about a preacher that she used to work for, a nationally known, uh, quite well-known preacher or evangelist, theologian, whatever. And she asked me about him. I thought, uh-oh, here's, here's where I'm going to tick her off. She said, she said, I know how you feel about John Osteen, <laughs> or Joel Osteen, rather. John was his dad, Joel Osteen. I said, oh, yeah. But, excuse me, I, I emailed her back and reluctantly said, well, I have... Uh, written two papers uh, at Oxford on the emergent church, and he is right in the midst of the group of those. And basically, the emergent church, uh, and this is just in a nutshell, um, is probably one of the most dangerous things that has crept into evangelical churches because it looks and sounds like it comes from people who claim to believe the Bible. But that's pretty much where it ends because from that point on, here, here it is in a nutshell, we don't need preachers. Now, I'm not saying that because I'm a preacher, but obviously right away, uh, it's against what the Bible describes as how to have a church. We see from Ephesians 4, he says he's called some to be preachers, teachers, evangelists. He's given these offices. <clears throat> this is the way God has structured his church, that all we need is spiritual coaches or spiritual leaders, and, and we just need to get away from church altogether, and, and we don't need somebody to instruct about the Scriptures. Just read it, and whatever it says to you is all that's important. Well, the Bible says man's heart is desperately wicked, so I don't want to know what I think. I want to know what God thinks, and it steps on my toes <laughs> all the time. It hurts, but I know when it hurts that I needed to read it. Every day when I open the Bible and I start reading God's Word, it's like, ah, I don't want to have to do that. I don't want to have to think that. I don't want to have to forgive that, but God's Word says I have to do that. And uh, I think one of the most dangerous things is <clears throat> the teaching, excuse me, at this time of year, and I'm hearing a lot of it, because a lot of political correctness enters into this emergent teaching, even by so-called Bible-believing churches. And one of the things is it's not important whether you believe the virgin birth or not. If you come from a scientific mindset and that bothers you that that's something that's just impossible and you don't want to believe in the virgin birth, it's not necessary. Um, let me put this in the vernacular. Bull hockey. Um, without the virgin birth, there's no gospel. There's no salvation. Uh, you say, oh, now, wait a minute. No, 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 no. And they're trying to say, well, uh, and now, if you have the Bible, it's called the Reser uh, Revised Standard Version. Um, it will take Isaiah seven fourteen, where God's Word says, I will give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and bring forth a child, and his name shall be Emmanuel. They say, well, the proper translation is Rama, which means a young woman. No. In every context, it means a young woman who is virgin. Now, it is of necessity for the virgin birth. Lord willing, we're going to see why here in the Scriptures in just a little bit. 
But God's Word says no interpretation of Scripture is of any private interpretation. So it's not what you think or want it to be or what I think or want it to be. What does God's Word teach all of the body of Christ historically? What did it mean in context? And just because I want it to mean something else, don't make it so. And if you eliminate the virgin birth, you have eliminated the basis of salvation. And Lord willing, we'll see why here in just a moment. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 1. If you would, please. Matthew chapter 1. It's a very familiar scripture. But let's, let's look at this. Matthew chapter 1, starting with verse 18. Matthew chapter 1, starting with verse 8. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Now, I want, let me stop right there. For 38, 39, how many, how many years I've been preaching, I always preach out of the King James Version. Now, I've had some people who have sat here and said, well, I go to your church because I realized you preach out of the King James Version. Now, I preach out of the King James Version because I believe it is accurate. I believe it is authoritative. I believe it is poetic. I believe it is time-tested and received. However, I will say that there are a few other very authoritative, very accurate translations, okay? So if you're, you're I don't want you to be misguided and think, well, he, he's against other translations. No, I tell you what, the New American Standard is probably the most accurate translation that there is uh, as far as uh, almost transliteration from Greek uh, to uh, English. Uh, the New English Version, or, or the, I'm sorry, the English Standard Version, I'll spit out here in a moment, very accurate translation. Uh, so I embrace the King James uh, and just always have... Uh, I love, I love what it has meant over the centuries. Okay, just, just to, Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother, Mary, was espoused or betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with a child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared, to him, appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and tuck unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus." May God bless that reading, hearing to our hearts has had just another moment's word of prayer. Father, again, in the name of Jesus, do we come into your holy presence, and we pray and ask that your word will go forth and accomplish all you send it forth to do. For it is in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Before we go any further, I want you to look at another passage of Scripture. This is in the Old Testament, in the Pentateuch, called the book of Leviticus. If you would, turn to Leviticus chapter 17. Leviticus, I've got so many things in my Bible that I've flipped through here. Uh, people give me little things, particularly if a child gives me something, I hang on to it forever. And I've got little things that kids have made and given to me, and I've got to stick them in there I like to keep them. Leviticus chapter 17, and I want you to look at verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. God's Word tells us the life is in the blood. As long as blood flows through your veins, you are alive. Even for, I think, after your heart stops for 23 seconds, blood still flows. The moment blood stops, you are dead. And uh, 
God's word tells us that the life is in the blood. We have to realize that the moment Adam and Eve sinned, and this, is, this may sound like a stretch, but the moment that they had partaken of the forbidden fruit, whatever it was, there was such a toxic blood poisoning that it is passed down from generation to generation. Sin and death absolutely, not figuratively, entered the bloodstream. As a result, they were not only infected, but all their offspring, which that includes all of us. God's Word says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and death has passed upon all men, because all have sinned. The reason why there is sickness and death is we have received from our parents and all of our parents. And in fact, as God's word tells us in Acts chapter 17, he has made uh, from one man all peoples of the earth. So whether you're red, yellow, black, or white, we all come from Adam and Eve, our great ad infinitum grandparents. And we have received... The result of their actions, which is literally blood poisoning that causes us to die. You see, Jesus did not have that. That's why it was of necessity that Jesus be born of the Virgin Mary. He was a partaker of the flesh because God's word says he was of the son of Mary. He was partaker of flesh. But let me give you an example. Dr. DeHaan, in his book called The Chemistry of the Blood, I don't even know if it's still in print or not. It ought to be. It is? Good, good. Because it really ought to be considered a classic. I guess it is. It's probably a Christian classic. But Dr. DeHaan, a medical doctor, he states how important it is and how scientifically transcends the ages of the importance of the virgin birth and how it was important, the importance of why and the necessity of the virgin birth. He said, take, for example, a regular hen chicken egg, which is basically the same, which is basically not the same, but basically an egg just like a woman uh, has, creates in her body, only on a much larger scale. Now, when that egg is not fertilized, you can keep it forever, and that yolk, the embryo, will stay yellow. But once that egg has been fertilized with the sperm, within a few hours you'll see blood streams, blood vessels inside the yolk. Now, when I was growing up, we had chickens. I hate chickens. They're nasty, aggravating. And every time I wanted to go out on a date and I had a brand new pair of Weegians, I'd go out on a porch and I'd step where they left their calling card. I hate chickens except at Colonel Sanders. But anyway... And you have to like chicken if you're ordained. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I met one preacher that didn't like chicken. I didn't trust him. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I remember we'd go get the eggs. And sometimes you'd get an egg that had been in there a little bit longer and had been fertilized. How many of you ever oh, seen blood veins go through the yolk of an egg? That egg had been fertilized. Uh, maybe once you... <laughs> you don't see that anymore, I guess, because they raise them so fast or whatever. But anyway, here's the interesting thing. Just like that shows you that once it's been fertilized, the blood starts a child, and I don't want to use the word fetus, a child that where the, the, the egg has been fertilized. You think you're getting science lesson this morning, but this is very important to understand why. Once the egg has been fertilized, what happens is the creation of a child inside the womb of a woman. Here's the interesting thing. That child is encased within the placenta. That child manufactures its own blood. At no time does the blood of the mother interact with the baby in the womb. All the nutrients, all the nourishment, even the waste from the child goes back through the placenta through a type of osmosis. Blood never interchanges between the child and the mother. That's why you, it happens very, all, uh, very many times, not always, that a mother with AIDS can give birth to a child that does not have AIDS because at no time does the blood 
change between child and mother. Now, it has flesh, nourishment, and such from the mother. I think you can already see why God's word was important because just like when you and I have received from Adam in our bloodstream the toxic of sin and death, Jesus did not have that in his blood. Soon after we die and we're taken to the undertaker, they will inject you with embalming fluid. Why? Because once the blood stops flowing, the decay process starts. When Jesus died, he did not decay. When they wrapped him up and put him in the tomb, you see, his blood was not tainted with sin and death. That's why Jesus said so clearly in John chapter 10, no man takes my life from me. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. No man takes my life from me. In other words, you can't kill me unless I will to die. You know what killed Jesus? Nothing that he had done, but only when your sin and my sin was put upon him could he allow himself to die. But nevertheless, his body entombed could not decay because his blood, remember, the, as we read in Leviticus 17, the life is in the blood. His blood did not have the taint of sin and death. In fact, I'm going to show you something else here that will probably blow your mind. Look, if you will, over to Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to look at several verses over here in Hebrews chapter 9, if I can. As bad as I hate to, I'm going to have to go through my Bible and put some of these things on file. It's, it's getting where I can't hardly turn the page. In Hebrews chapter 9, we're going to look at a number of passages here. Let's first look at 13 and 14 of Hebrews chapter 9. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? That's why we are saved. You've heard me say this many times. We are saved by Jesus Christ plus nothing. The, I don't care what denomination. God isn't concerned, and in, 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 I'm not trying to tell you what God thinks, but studying God's word, it doesn't matter if you belong to a Baptist church, a Methodist church, a Presbyterian church, even a Catholic church, as long as you realize that your salvation is solely based on you're covered in the blood of Jesus. Because if you're not covered in the blood of Jesus, remember when the children, just to show you how important the emphasis is of the blood, remember when the children of Israel were in Egypt, the only thing that saved they or their household or anybody else, if the blood was put over the door, and when the angel of death saw the blood over the door, he would pass by. All through God's word from Genesis to present, the life is in the blood. The emphasis, the teaching. In fact, there's what's called the scarlet thread of the gospel. It goes from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Without the understanding that we are covered in the blood. We, there, there have been those that claim that Christians preach a bloody gospel. Absolutely right. For God's word says without the remission of blood, parenthetical, without the remission, there is no forgiveness of sin. It is of necessity that we realize the virgin birth, that we realize that the blood that was in the veins of Jesus Christ was of God the Father, the Holy Ghost, and not of mankind. The Mormons teach that Mary was impregnated by a passing centurion soldier. Ergo, you're dead in trespasses and sin. If Jesus Christ was not born of the virgin, then his blood was no different than anybody else. God's word says, if all the blood of the bulls would go, these were a type, a shadow of that which would be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Had to be done over and over and over again. In fact, if you'll notice that the temple on earth in the Old Testament was built in, uh, give, God gave them instructions how to build it in the likeness and fashion of that which is the temple in heaven. Temple in heaven, yeah, that's right. And if one thing there is difference, though, that God's Word tells us is in heaven at the temple, that is not in the one that in the Old Testament was given directions. There was not a chair, a seat in the Old Testament temple. You know why? 
because they had to offer it over and over again. They couldn't sit down. Show you something else. While we're in Hebrews chapter 9, let's start with verse 23. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens, just what I was telling you about, should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. The, 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 remember the Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled with the blood of bulls and of goats and such in the Old Testament? God's Word says the, the Ark, or not, well, not necessarily the Ark, but the altar in heaven is sprinkled with things better than this. Now, here's where, what I believe. That since Jesus' blood could not die, the life is in the blood. It was not tainted. I believe uh, this, I can, I can sideways substantiate it with Scripture, but I can't emphatically. I believe every drop of his blood still exists in heaven. Let's go on. I'll show you why. Should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifice than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures or the types of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often. Remember, uh, here they had to constantly be offering bulls and goats and doves. As the high priest entered to the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once, in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after that the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. God's word also tells us in Hebrews 1st chapter, when he had by himself purged or cleansed our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the Father. You see, no chair in the Old Testament because it had to be offered every year. But when Christ, once and for all, God's Word says, offered his blood on the altar in heaven, he could sit down at the right hand of the Father. Without the shedding of blood and without you, well, look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. Revelation chapter 1. In verse 5. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Now look at this, very important. Unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Remember that old hymn? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? If you're not covered in the blood, you say, how do I get covered in the blood of Jesus? You ask. You ask. You believe that the blood that flowed from his side, from his head, from his hands, from his back, from his legs and feet, that that blood washed away all your sins. As Colossians 2, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. It took them out of the way, nailing them to the cross, and having spooled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. In other words, your sins and my sins were written down, but they were nailed to the cross. And when his blood flowed down, it washed over that writing. And after it passed by, though your sins be as scarlet, should be white as snow. Amen. Let's stand if you would please. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come into your presence. We who are so undeserving, but yet you loved us and you still love us. Wash away all our sins. Blot out our transgressions to remember them no more. And, Father, we know that our salvation came at a high price of unimaginable suffering that you endured out of love for us. And we thank you. We appreciate it now and forever. And I pray, Father God, that if anyone knows you not as the Lord and the Savior of their life, that they'll pray this prayer I'm about to pray. Dear Jesus, forgive me 
of all my sins. Come into my heart and save me. I receive you as my Lord and my God and my personal Savior. Holy Spirit, please fill me to overflowing. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray.